general anatomy, terminology, planes and regions. When describing the position of body structures, you must bear in mind that this is always in relation to the anatomical position. The subject stands erect with arms by their side and palms facing forwards. Location of structures are often described in relation to the anatomical planes. The mid-sagittal plane is marked by a vertical line running in an anteroposterior direction, dividing the body into equal and near symmetrical left and right halves. This line runs through the center of the nose, the sternum and the symphysis pubis. The coronal plane is a vertical line that runs on a lateral to lateral direction, dividing the body into non-symmetrical anterior and posterior portions. It is at right angles to the sagittal plane. The transverse plane is marked by a horizontal line dividing the body into superior and inferior portions. The four abdominal quadrants. The abdominal cavity can be mapped out using the four quadrant system. A mid-sagittal line is drawn from the xiphoid process through to the umbilicus and to the symphysis pubis. The transverse line is also drawn at umbilical level. The four quadrants are named accordingly. Right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, left lower quadrant. This system can be used in mapping out large abdominal structures or when defining broader patterns of pain. The nine abdominal pelvic regions. There are two horizontal planes and two vertical planes which divide the abdomen into nine regions or compartments. These regions are important for the definition of organ position and more specific location of symptoms. The superior horizontal plane is drawn at the subcostal plane, that is the level of the 10th costal cartilage. The inferior horizontal plane is drawn at the transtubercular level, that is a point on the iliac tubicles between the iliac crests and anterior superior iliac spine. The vertical lines or mid-clavicular planes are formed by two parasagittal lines extending downwards from the middle of the clavicles. They go through the semilunar lines of the abdomen and terminate at the midpoint between the anterior superior iliac spines and the symphysis pubis. The central squares or regions are named the epigastric, umbilical and hypogastric or pubic. The lateral regions are the right and left hypochondriac, the right and left lumbar and the right and left inguinal regions. These are also called the pelvic or iliac regions. The skeletal system the greater tubercle or tuberosity of the humerus. This is located inferolaterally below the arch of the acromion. The choragoid process is slightly medial to the midpoint on this line. It may be identified by placing modest pressure over this region whilst the arm is rotated internally and externally. the lesser tuberosity of the humerus. It is more proximal to the acromioclavicular joint and in relation to the greater tuberosity it is slightly more medial and inferior. The lesser tuberosity is just lateral to the coracoid process. Unlike the greater tuberosity, the lesser tuberosity is more difficult to palpate. The coracoid process. 
It is located inferior to the lateral one-third of the clavicle and almost inferiorly to the acromioclavicular joint. It may only be palpated with firm pressure. When you are over it, it will feel slightly tender to deep pressure. It is about one centimeter below the clavicle, deep to the medial border of the deltoid muscle. The greater tuberosity. The lesser tuberosity. The coracoid process. The greater tuberosity. The lesser tuberosity. The coracoid process. The lateral and medial epicondyles of the humerus. These are bony projections of the distal end of the humerus. The medial epicondyle is larger and more prominent than the lateral epicondyle. The ulnar nerve runs in a groove on the back of the medial epicondyle. The olecranon process of the ulna. This is the most proximal part of the ulna. In the anatomical position, the olecranon process faces directly posteriorly. It is a large, thick, curved, bony eminence convex posteriorly upon which the triceps tendon is attached. It can be palpated in the posterior and medial aspect of the elbow joint during flexion and extension movements. The staggered process of the ulna. This is a small and sometimes sensitive projection that can be palpated in the medial aspect of the wrist, just above the crease line. It is partially shielded by the tendons of the flexor and extensor carpi ulnaris. To expose the stylet process of the ulna, deviate the wrist radially or laterally. The head of the radius. This is at the proximal end of the radius, approximately one centimeter distal and slightly medial to the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. It has a cylindrical shape and on its upper surface it has a shallow cup or fovea for the articulation with the capitulum of the humerus. The neck of the radius is defined by a groove which contains the annular ligament in order to give it stability when the radius is rotated along its long axis. The head of the radius may be palpated with a pinch-like hold of the uppermost lateral aspect of the forearm whilst it is supinated and pronated. The stylet process of the radius. This is located on the lateral aspect of the distal radius. It extends obliquely downwards as a conical projection. It is much wider than its ulnar counterpart. Part of this projection is covered by the brachioradialis muscle. It can be tender due to the presence of the superficial branches of the radial nerve. The proximal carpal row is made up of the scaphoid, lunate, triquitral, and pisiform bones. The pisiform is located just inferior to the styloid process of the ulna. The pisiform is a sesamoid bone. Part of the flexor carpi ulnaris tendon is attached to it. It is anterior to the triquitral bone. The scaphoid bone. This is located laterally and forms the proximal articulation with the radius. Distally, it articulates with the trapezium and trapezoid bones. It forms part of the base of what is referred to as the anatomical snuff box. The distal carpal row is made up of the trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate bones.
These bones are difficult to distinguish by palpation except from the hook of the hamate. The hamate is located on the medial aspect of the wrist on the distal carpal row. The hook-like process is located on the volar surface of the hand. It is projected forward and slightly laterally. The flexor retinaculum. This is a tough fibrous rectangular band attached medially on the hook of the hamate and pisiform. Laterally, it is attached to the scaphoid and trapezium. The metacarpals. These are five cylindrical bones made up of a shaft with a proximal base and a distal head. The heads form the knuckle bones when making a fist. They form mobile articulations with the proximal phalanges. The carpal metacarpal articulations are not easily identifiable as they are rigid except from the first. The first carpal metacarpal joint of the thumb is a saddle type mobile articulation between the trapezium and the first metacarpal bone. The phalanges or digits 2 to 5 are made up of three segments, a proximal, an intermediate and a distal phalanx. These articulations form hinge joints. The first digit of the thumb has only two segments, a proximal and a distal phalanx. The lower limbs. The iliac crests. The crest of the ilium or iliac crest is the superior border of the wing of the ilium and the superolateral margin of the greater pelvis. The iliac crests may be palpated starting posteriorly from the posterior superior iliac spine, then progress superiorly and anteriorly until the anterior superior iliac spine is felt. Alternatively, the hands may be rested on the uppermost border of the iliac crests by sliding them down the abdominal oblique muscles. When a firm contact is established, you can trace the bony crest anteriorly until you reach the projections of the anterior superior iliac spine. Repeat this procedure posteriorly until you contact the posterior superior iliac spine. The anterior superior iliac spine. The anterior superior iliac spine refers to the anterior extremity of the iliac crests of the pelvis. They are held approximately 30 centimeters apart, but they are slightly wider in females. They provide attachments for the inguinal ligament, the sartorius muscle, and the tensor fascia latte. The anterior superior iliac spine is an important landmark of the surface anatomy. The apex of the iliac crests crosses the spinous process of L4 or it is at the level of L4-5 intervertebral space in about 80% of the population. The posterior superior iliac spine. The posterior border of the ala can be traced until a firm rounded projection is reached. In most individuals when standing they may be identified by two dimples superior and medial to the glutei muscles. They are commonly referred to as the dimples of Venus. The distance between the two posterior superior iliac spines is shorter than the anterior superior iliac spines and although variable, they are about 10 centimeters apart. The posterior superior iliac spine serves for the attachment of the oblique portion of the posterior sacroiliac ligaments and the multifidus muscle. They are used as reference landmarks of the lumbar spine. The posterior superior iliac spine crosses the spinous process of S2 
more consistently than the iliac crests with the L4, and it is therefore considered a more reliable landmark. The ischiochugorosities. These are two large bony protrusions on the inferior most margin of the ischium. They are located deep within the glutei and are commonly referred to as the sitting bones. They can be palpated when the patient is prone so that the glutei are more relaxed. You can feel this if they were to sit bolt upright at the edge of the couch with your outstretched palms placed underneath. They mark the lateral boundary of the pelvic outlet. The greater trochander of the femur. This is a large projection on the proximal part of the femur that serves for muscle attachments. The greater trochander is located lateral to the hip joint and they are easy to palpate. They are just inferolaterally in relation to the hip joint. If the hand is placed flat against the skin about 10 cm below the iliac crests and the subject rotates their hip while standing, you will feel the movement of the large rounded protrusion of the greater trochanter. The lesser trochanter. This may be palpated indirectly as it is shielded deep within the medial compartment of the thigh. They are inferior and medial to the greater trochanters. With the hip placed in slight flexion, abduction and external rotation, place progressive pressure with the tips of your fingers medially and inferiorly to the inguinal ligament. By moving the hips from passive flexion to extension, you may feel the resistance of the tensing iliopsoas tendon. If the bursa is inflamed, it will be tender. The medial and lateral femoral condyles. First, let us identify the joint line of the knee. This is the space between the femoral and tibial condyles. It can be identified by a soft depression on either side of the inferior part of the patella when the knee is in 90 degree flexion. These are two large rounded or convex projections at the end of the femur which form the articulating surfaces with the tibia below. The medial condyle is larger than the lateral condyle. On the posterior surface of the medial condyle, the linear aspera this is a ridge running down the posterior shaft of the femur, turns into the medial supracondylar ridge. With the knee flexed to 90 degrees, part of the condyles may be palpated on either side of the patella. The medial and lateral epicondyles of the femur. These are two outermost protrusions of the medial and lateral surfaces of the condyles. The epicondyles are best palpated with the knee in flexion. Run your fingers medially and laterally from the patella. The adductor tubicle forms a slightly larger protrusion on the medial epicondyle, about 2 cm proximal to that. The medial and lateral tibial condyles. These are just below the femoral condyles. Their superior surface is flat, forming the tibial plateau. The medial tibial condyle is slightly larger than the lateral. Apart from the posterior borders, the rest of the condyles are easily palpable. At the lateral tibial condyle, about one centimeter below the posterior lateral perimeter, the rounded head of the fibula can be palpated with ease the patella. This sesamoid bone provides attachments for the quadriceps muscles above and the patella ligament below. When the knee is held in extension, it is mostly situated over the femur in the trochlea between the lateral and medial ridges. The patella is broadened superiorly with a slightly convex superior border 
but pointed and narrower at its inferior margin. With the knee passively extended, it is easily mobile, but it is rigid when the knee is in flexion. The tibial tuberosity. This is a large, rounded protrusion on the proximal anterior aspect of the tibia in line with the patella. It forms the attachment of the patella ligament. It is more palpable when the knee is flexed. The medial malleolus of the ankle joint. This forms the most distal projection of the tibia. It forms a pyramidal-like process. Its internal surface forms the medial border of the tibiotalar joint, the lateral malleolus of the ankle joint. This forms the most distal projection of the fibula. It also forms a pyramidal-like process. Its internal surface forms the lateral border of the talocrural joint. The lateral malleolus descends to a slightly lower level than the medial malleolus, the calcaneus. This is the largest bone in the foot. A roughened area on its posterior superior aspect marks the attachment of the Achilles tendon. The cuboid bone articulates with its anterior and lateral sides. The navicular articulates with its anterior and medial sides. On the medial side of the calcaneum, below the middle talar facet, is the sustentaculum tali. This serves for the attachments of several ligaments. The talus. This bone forms a hinge-like joint located between the malleoli of the tibia and fibula. Most of its superior surface is covered by the distal tibiofibula joint unless the foot is held in full plantar flexion. In this position, between your thumb and index fingers, you will feel the anterior part of the head of the tail. Directly anterior to the talus, you can feel the talonavicular joint, the cuboid. This is located laterally within the tarsals of the foot. Its position can be identified by following the extended proximal projection of the fifth metatarsal. At the end of this bony projection is a soft indentation marking the location of the cuboid. Anteriorly, the cuboid articulates with the fourth and fifth metatarsals. Posteriorly, it articulates with the calcaneus. On the medial surface, it articulates with both the lateral cuneiform and the navicular bones. Anteriorly, the cuboid articulates with the fourth and fifth metatarsals. Posteriorly, it articulates with the calcaneus. On the medial surface, it articulates with both the lateral cuneiform and the navicular bones. The navicula. It is located on the medial side of the foot, forming the apex of the medial arch. Proximally, it articulates with the talus and distally with the three cuneiform bones. Laterally, it articulates with the cuboid. The navicula can be identified along its medial border by finding its prominent tuberosity about 2.5 cm obliquely anteriorly and inferiorly to the medial malleolus. The navicula. It is located on the medial side of the foot forming the apex of the medial arch. Proximally, it articulates with the talus and distally with the three cuneiform bones. Laterally, it articulates with the cuboid. The navicula can be identified along its medial border by finding its prominent tuberosity about 2.5 cm obliquely anteriorly and inferiorly to the medial malleolus. The metatarsals. These are five long bones slightly convex superiorly. They form a rigid platform for the forefoot. 
the first metatarsal is by far the thickest, forming a strong articulation with the proximal first phalanx. The distal heads of the metatarsals and proximal heads of the phalanges are larger and more prominent on the plantar aspect of the foot. These are five long bones slightly convex superiorly. They form a rigid platform for the forefoot. The first metatarsal is by far the thickest, forming a strong articulation with the proximal first phalanx. The distal heads of the metatarsals and proximal heads of the phalanges are larger and more prominent on the plantar aspect of the foot. The phalanges of the feet. Like the hands, there are three phalanges for each toe, a proximal, an intermediate, and a distal. The first toe has only two phalanges, a proximal and a distal. They are long bones forming hinge-like joints. The smallest is the distal phalanx of the fifth toe. Like the hands, there are three phalanges for each toe, a proximal, an intermediate, and a distal. The first toe has only two phalanges, a proximal and a distal. They are long bones forming hinge-like joints. The smallest is the distal phalanx of the fifth toe.